Amen. Thank you, Wanda, for playing for us today. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you have them close at hand, Jeremiah chapter number 3. Jeremiah chapter number 3. It might be a little bit of a deception, uh, but we are going into chapter 2 and then through chapter 3. So just to let everybody know, but we're going to concentrate our scripture reading on chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And if you find your found your place there in Jeremiah chapter 3, please stand for the reading of God's word. Verse number 1 of chapter 3. They say, if a man put away his wife, she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Lift up thine eyes unto the high places, and, where, and see where thou hast not been lain with. In the ways hast thou sat for them as the Arabian in the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there have been no latter rain, and thou hast a whore's forehead, thou refusest to be ashamed. Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me, My father, thou art the guide of my youth? Will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldst. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on our message tonight. Dearly Father, we thank you so much for helping us to, uh, to know you better through your word. Father, it is a delight in our hearts that we can read your word and to know what you would have us to do. Father, help us and equip us with all that you want us to have, and may we get closer to you, grow more and more mature in Christ, and truly may it affect our lives in a very positive way. I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'll ask for a thought. The first thing that comes to mind when you hear this word, are you ready? The word is oblivious. And don't say Pastor Joe. Yeah. <laughs> At times it seems that way. I'm like, oh, okay. So oblivious. Unknowing or unseen. Okay. Judah? The word was oblivious. Unaware? Okay. Yes, Wanda? Hidden? Yep. All right. Any other thoughts? Pastor? Without a clue, yes. <laughs> That's a very good definition of it. Somebody that just not there. So anybody else? Any other thoughts? Oblivious. Judah? Yeah, not quite. Not quite. It, uh, it means to be unaware of something, to be uh, uh, just oblivious without a clue. Yeah, that's, that's a good definition of it. Anybody with any examples of somebody being oblivious? Floor? Stoplight? Right, right. If, if you are behind somebody and that person is not making sure that that red light is no longer red but green, uh, then you, you can uh, encourage them to uh, get off their phone or whatever they're doing and go through the light. For us, it's interesting mm, that for our intersection, for Ronald Reagan going to 27, there is a sign there, and only a couple times have somebody been... Uh, oblivious of this sign and it says no turn on red and so one time you know i was in in line to to, to turn uh and uh, of course it was red it always it usually is and uh one there's three cars in line and so i was the third car there was one car in front which he was doing exactly what he was supposed to and uh so he did not turn and this guy in the second car he was upset. He kept on honking his horn and, and you now you know, gets his head out the window. What's going on? And, uh, and the guy literally got out of his car and just pointed at the sign. No turn on red. And then he gets back in his car. Yeah. Some people are oblivious. Like if that was me and I'm like, okay, why is this person not going? Oh, right there. That sign says, 
oh, that reason why he's not going. So he doesn't want a ticket, that's for sure. <laughs> all right, any other stories about oblivious? Pastor, all right, all right. James? Uh, yep, oblivious to the speed limit. Sometimes you look down and all of a sudden, oh, I'm going too fast. So yeah, that happened to me when I was taking, taking you home. Or no, I was, I was bringing you to the church. And then all of a sudden I looked down, oh, 67 is not 55. Uh, last time I checked. Judah? Okay, now we're getting there. Now we're getting there. That's, that's the, the point. So all right, anybody else? That's Wanda? Sometimes you, you catch yourself of, you know, I have not been listening in this conversation. I don't even know what he's talking about or she's talking about or whatever. Sometimes that, that happens. Yeah, a lot of times that happens. All right, uh, Mackenzie? Ah, a glass door. Now, now, don't be too hard on yourself because almost every single one of my kids have done that because we were over at my, uh, my so my brother's wife's brother, um, he you know, was showing us around his new house and, and all that, and there was this porch area and this glass door that you could not tell was a glass door. And every single one of the kids, bam, just, wow, okay, there's a glass door right there. You might want to put some stickers on it or something, you know, that, that somebody would be... Yes, Norman? Oh, <laughs> oh boy. Judah? Now, I don't want to name names, so, yeah. <laughs> now, you're, you, you will not be named by me in, in my sermons, so the, the party will be, uh, all the guilty will be found innocent, or whatever. Uh, <laughs> all right, Wanda? No, was, wow, so he, he went through a glass door, cut his jugular vein, but knew what to do, and wow. Oh, that's a, that's a praise that he survived, yeah. All right, Norman? That, that'd be very true. That'd be very true. So yeah, oblivious to manner, especially if you're in a different country. Um, all right, a couple more. James. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, environment issues are something to be aware of. Um, now the pseudoscience, maybe, is kind of, okay, you can argue about that, whether or not uh, everything is going to uh, be destroyed by man's doing, but we know by the Bible that, okay, it's God that's really going to do it. Now, we went through Revelation, so yeah, it's like, well, I don't think global warming is going to do all of this stuff, that everything is descriptive here in Revelation. I don't think that's going to be the cause. I think God himself is going to do all these things. So, yeah. All right. Right. So, and so to take care of the environment and have dominion over the earth, that's kind of a, a thought for us. It's good not to litter, you know, pick up trash and, and all that. That's good, but we don't go overboard and, and uh, worship the earth because we know that it's a temporary place. James. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, oblivious to just common sense. Yeah, that's common sense I've heard is deemed uncommon these days. Uh, so, yeah, so interesting. All right, I think, uh, okay, go ahead, Ezekiel. Well, there's... Okay, so there's a glass door, and you guys banged your head on the glass door, every single one of you, except for, I think, one. Uh, but anyway, um, but going through the glass, that would be bad, too, because then you got broken glass. So, yes, good observations. Oblivious. Very interesting. I, I would uh, try to say that I've never been oblivious in my life, but that's not true. Uh, one time, I was, uh, you know... Uh, Somebody lent me their car. Oh, this is going to be fun. Uh, so someone lent me their car, and um, right when I got in the car, and I noticed something was peculiar about this car, because uh, every time I went, had this you know really loud scratching noise, <laughs> like I'm dragging something. I thought, well, that's kind of peculiar. I'm not really sure what that is. And then a little bit later, I'm like, oh, that's what it is. It's the brake. It's the parking brake. <laughs> I was oblivious because I never really dealt with the parking brake much except for getting my license. You know how to engage it. I'm like, okay, I know how to engage it. I don't know what it's for. Uh, it's for emergency, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> but I never really engaged it after that fact. So, uh, but yeah, so it's an interesting thing. So I was oblivious to things that you think I ought to know that, but now I do very much. Um, and now use it on a, on a regular basis, and so praise the Lord. Um, but yeah, there's one um, illustration of being oblivious. Uh, in 1903, it was December, the Wright brothers, 
uh, went for one of their first rides in their airplane. And then they sent a message to their sister, uh, Catherine, saying, Hey, we went 120 feet. We're going to be home for Christmas. And so she, sent, she took the message, went to a local newspaper, and was going to have it you know, printed. And uh, just an amazing thing. Man has learned how to fly. And he gave it to, she gave it to uh, the editor, and he looked at it and said, Oh, that's nice. They'll be home for Christmas. They're oblivious to the fact that, okay, the Wright brothers just learned how to fly in their plane. Oblivious. Yes, you're not aware of things that are going on around you. You're not aware of your surroundings. You're not aware of various things in life, and it could be detrimental to you. For instance, if you're not aware of things going on in traffic, then all of a sudden a car hits. Yeah, it happens all the time. In fact, this morning I was kind of concerned for the people living on 33 because there was an accident, a very bad accident, uh, this morning. It was before 8 o'clock, evidently, because uh, I got here by 8. But there was a bad accident on, the th- on 33 where it met 474. And I thought, oh, I hope everything's okay. Well, yeah, those who lived over there didn't say anything about it, so they must have cleaned it up before that point. But yeah, if you are oblivious in driving, it could be very detrimental. For spiritual realities, if we're oblivious to sin, it is very detrimental. Here in Jeremiah chapter number 3, we're going to look at uh, this part. Actually, really, chapter number 2 from verses uh, 19 through Chapter 3, verse number 5, we're going to learn about Israel, really the nation of Judah, that they were oblivious to their own sin and to the, the how bad their sin really was. So notice with me what we're going to see. First of all, we're going to see that they were oblivious to the goodness of God. They were first oblivious to the goodness of God. Notice with me in verse number 19. It says, Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Now, know, therefore, and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that thy fear is not in thee, saith the Lord of hosts. For of old time I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bands, that thou sayest, I will not transgress. When thou, when upon every high hill and under every green tree thou wanderest, playing the harlot. Verse 21, yet I had planted thee a noble vine, holy a right seed. How then art thou turned into the degenerate plant and of a strange vine unto me? For though thou wash me with nitre, and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord God. Here he says specifically that, oh, how it was in the past. Now, remember last week, and that our our sermon last week was really about how the goodness of God is there, and he is displaying it to the nation of Judah, but yet they forsake God, they forgot God, and went after other idols, went after the gods of the lands. Now think about how ridiculous that is. The nation of Israel goes into the land. They wipe out the inhabitants who are worshiping these idols, then the Israelites take, then take the land, take all the, the fruit of the land, take all the, all the things that are good about the land, and they, then they take the idols and start worshiping those idols. Well, it didn't help these people who were in the land, obviously, because God helped you take the land and take possession of the land. They are no longer there because of their own wickedness. They, they were not right with God. It was God deemed it time for them to have judgment and use the nation of Israel to do that. And now, at this point in time, they turn from God and worship an idol that, well, you have to move yourself. You have to put it in whatever location you want. You have to dust it. You know, I don't know how many of you like dusting things, you know, at your house. 
They have to dust whatever idol you have. And whatever it is, you have to make sure that you keep it safe. Otherwise, it will be destroyed either by fire or by a storm of some sort. It will be destroyed at some point in time. So you have to take care of it. Such a ridiculous notion. But yet, that is the reality the nation of Judah had. So they were worshiping these idols that were made of stone, that were made of wood that could not do anything for themselves, nor could they bless whatever inhabitant they find themselves in. But yet they turn from God to worship these things. How terrible that is. How ridiculous is that. But yet, so often people that go after sin do the same exact thing. They reject, they forsake God, the fountain of living waters, and they go after something that cannot even hold water, something, a cistern, broken cistern that can have no water in it. That is what sin is like. Every time that we turn our way from God and go after something else in our life, that is what it's like. God has supplied us with all the wonderful blessings that He has. He has given us salvation through Christ. He has given us justification, that fact that we are right before God. We talked about that this morning. We have the, the fact of this sanctification, that right now God is working on me to make me the way I ought to be, uh, as the song goes. And so, He's working on me so that I can be more like Christ that I could be more loving, me be more joyful, be more long-suffering towards people, be more, have more goodness, have more gentleness, all these things that I absolutely, desperately need. He is working on me in that way. So often, if we find ourselves that we are so used to God that we might be oblivious to the goodness of God in our own lives. The people in Judah, they were definitely oblivious to the fact that God has been with them. God has been good towards them. God has been merciful to them because all these years of worshiping idols and God is long-suffering toward them, hoping that they would turn from their sin and turn back to him but he knows ultimately they won't and ultimately there will be judgment and they will be leaving the land for 70 years and so ultimately that is what's going to happen but all this time god has long suffering towards his people wanting them to turn back to him him he says that he has given us all given them all these things he's unshackled their their burdens they they went from egypt where they were enslaved to freedom and then with that freedom they used it well to do things that they ought not to do and so there god is wanting them to return to them but yet israel will not turn back maybe a few individuals maybe Jeremiah is one of them, that uh, he's a prophet. Uh, Josiah, the king uh, at that time, does turn to the Lord. And w by that, he buys himself the peace that he wanted, the, the necessary uh, achievements of not going into the Babylonian captivity during his lifetime. But yet, they will succumb to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar will take over and take them all out of the land. And so we're going to see that in Jeremiah. Every single one of these prophecies comes true. Every single one, very specifically, they are coming true. And so amazing to, to think about all the goodness that God has for us as individuals, that he has given us Christ, that he has given us adoption of children, that he has given us all these wonderful blessings. Yet, so often Christians tend to, well, forget God. I don't want to say forsake God. That sounds terrible. But anytime that we run after sin and not God, that's exactly what we're doing. And so these people are exactly doing that. Notice with me what it says here. Uh, verse 21, yet I had planted thee a noble vine. Israel is always referred to as that of a vine or a vineyard uh, specifically. And he says, I have given you everything that you possibly could have wanted and yet, you became something that you shouldn't be. And so we see that they were oblivious to the, the, 
harshness and the reality of sin uh, due to they were oblivious to the goodness of God. They were forgetting what God did for them in the land. Now, notice with me, the, uh, what they were actually going towards is their own desires. Notice with me, verse number 23. How canst thou say, I am not polluted, I have not gone after Balaam? See thy way in the valley, know what thou hast done. Thou art a swift uh, dromedary, traversing her ways, a wild ass or donkey, used to the wilderness that snuffed up the wind at her pleasure and her occasion who can turn her away. All they that seek her will not weary themselves. In her month they shall find her. Withhold thy foot from being unshod and thy throat from thirst. But thou sayest there is no hope. No, for I have loved strangers and after them will I go. Here God compares these the, the nation of Judah, specifically to wild animals. And the specifics of the wild animals is, like the wild animals, they go after what is their instincts. They go after that which they want. Has no wisdom whatsoever. They just go after what they're craving at the time. And he says the nation of Judah is just like that. Whatever their lust is, they go after it. Or whatever they're craving, that's what they go after. And specifically, it is that of idolatry that they go after and worship the gods of the land, the worship and, and practice the heathen worship of the land. Things that are terrible that according to what God says in, chap, in verse number uh, 19, that they do this on every single hill in the land that there is a grove, that there is an altar, there is an idol on every single green hill in the nation of, of Judah. And so with that in mind, they go after exactly what they crave. There is no wisdom ab at all about whether they think, oh, I should not do that because that's wrong. No, they just do what is absolutely natural to them. They don't care about God God is not in their thoughts. God is not there uh, you know, showing them in his, in his word because they don't want his word. The, the word is not with them at this point in time. They don't care about that. Josiah, they give Josiah the word of God. He trembles at the word, but yet probably not many other people in the nation of Judah will tremble at the word of God. So we see that they go after what they crave. Notice with me what happens here. He has, they compare the, the nation of Israel, or Judah to that of a thief. Notice with me verse 26. As the thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They, their kings, their princes, their priests, and their prophets, saying to a stock, Thou art my father, and to a stone, Thou hast brought me forth. For they have turned their back unto me, and not their face, but in the time of their trouble, they will say, Arise and save us. Think about how silly this is. They have these gods made of stone, made of, well, here it's called a stock, uh, that of stubble, some straw creature thing that they created. And then, okay, they're worshiping that thing, whatever it is, and all of a sudden, something bad happens in their life, and now, okay, I need to go to God. Okay, God, it's time for you to arise. I haven't been worshiping you at all. Uh, I've been worshiping that thing, but that's okay. You can save me, and because you're great, and you're worthy to be praised, and okay, it's time to... Time to get the show going on. Here's what he says. <laughs> Verse number 28. But where are thy, thy gods? And thou hast made thee. Let them arise, if they can save thee in the time of thy trouble. For according to the number of thy cities are thy gods, O Judah. Wow. Okay, God, it's, it's time for you to arrive. We really need you. Like, we didn't need you before because we have all these other gods. Number as the amount of cities. You think about how many cities is in the state of Florida. 
that would be a lot of idols. Just, just saying. And he says, no, no. You go to those gods. You ask them to help you and see if they will. They are oblivious to the fact of what they've been doing is doing something that is to their hurt. Something that cannot absolutely save them whatsoever. When times of calamity come, they are oblivious to the fact of their sin. And notice with me what happens here. Uh, verse number 29. Wherefore will ye plead with me? Ye all have transgressed against me, saith the Lord. In vain have I smitten your children. They received no correction. Your own sword hath devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. O generation, see ye the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness unto Israel, a land of darkness? Wherefore say my people, we are lords. We will come no more unto thee. Can a maid forget her ornaments? Or bride her attire, yet my people have forgotten me days without number. Think about that. He's saying that his people has forgotten him. He is the best part of following God and having this entirety of the promised land, of having all the vineyards, having all the cattle, having everything there. God is the best part. No matter what we have, whatever blessings he might bestow upon us, if it's the blessings that we are praising God about and not God himself, we're in trouble. Because God is absolutely the best part of following him. You know, it's an amazing thing to think about. You know, we look forward to heaven. We are in Christ. We're going to heaven. We look forward to it and we see the, the description of it in Revelation. The streets of gold, the, the gates of pearl, the magnificent structures that are there. Just an amazing thing to, to think about, this, this enormous cube, this enormous city coming out of heaven like a bride adorned for her husband coming down to the new earth that God has created. And so much we can fixate on the different attributes of this city, but the best part about heaven is not the streets of gold. It's not the reward that we're going to get. It's not the city itself that will look amazing. No, it's God himself dwelling with man the glory of god will shine throughout this city amazing re reality of who god is and more and more that we're going to see on that day it's not going to be how glorious everything is but rather how great god is god is the best part in life god is the best part in the next life that we have in christ he is the best part. But yet he says for his own nation, you have forgotten me. Can a, well, let me read this part. This part is really amazing. Can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Here's, here's the, the, the illustration that he's using. So a, a woman is about to get married. And then so she comes to the wedding and it's not anything spectacular. It's no, there's not wedding gown. It's just usual clothes. It's, oh, it's not a big deal. Back in these days, no, no. You would have to have, the maids will have to have their ornaments, the specific jewelry that they will be wearing. And specifically, the bride will be attired as such that you know, okay, there's no doubt about it, she's getting married. She's going to be, uh, betroth she is betrothed, she is going to the wedding, and she is going to get married. There's no doubt about it, that is a wedding garment. But he says, no, no, my people are acting like this is just, oh, it's just the usual thing. That God himself is with his people, helping his people, sharing blessings with his people, and they don't think he's a big deal at all. Oh, they'll run to him when things get tough. Yeah, that's true. God, help. This has a rise in my life. My car won't work. My, uh, my house, you know, there's something wrong with my house. My, the plumbing's not working or, or whatever. God, help. But a lot of times, well, have we been really close to God all this time? Have we been really, really walking with the Lord all this time? Or are we like the nation of Israel? They went after other gods. God says, no, no. Ask your gods to help you. See if they can. 
It's terrible. Can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. I think that phrase alone is the most... Such a phrase of despair. Days without number. It wasn't like they took a week off. It wasn't like they took a month off. It's been years and years and years for these people not to get close to God. Now, here's an experiment. Don't do it. Um, <laughs> for those who, who are, are married, if you want to have a terrible marriage, I can tell you exactly how to do it. Um, ignore your spouse. Don't talk with them. Don't even get close to them. You know, just, uh, just live basically separate lives and uh, you'll have the worst marriage imaginable. Well, that's exactly what's happening here. The nation of Israel, nope, they don't want much to do with God. It's great that they gave the land. It's great that they have all the blessings, but no, no, we don't really want God. We just want His stuff. Days without number. Why trimmest thou thy way to seek love? Therefore hast thou also taught the wicked ones thy ways. They are so bad that the heathen are taken notes as to how corrupt they have become. They're, the, the heathen themselves round about in the land, they're not as bad as what the nation of Judah has become. It's terrible. They're taking notes and seeing and admiring their wicked ways. Verse 34, And also in thy skirts is found the blood of the souls of the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but upon all these. Yet thou sayest, because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me. Behold, I will plead with thee, because thou sayest, I have not sinned. They are oblivious to the fact of their own sin. They would say, no, I haven't sinned. What are you talking about? I'm doing fine. Oh, this idol, that, that's nothing really, but that's your sin. You say that you don't have sin, but God is reckoning to them, yes, you do, and it is permeating the land, and because of that, you're going to be taken out of the land. Notice with me, verse 30, 37. Yea, thou shalt go forth from him, and thine hands upon thine head, for the Lord hath rejected thy confidences, and thou shalt not prosper in them. They were thinking, okay, well, it's okay if we have problems. If Nebuchadnezzar comes, okay, don't worry. We have our confidences. We'll have Egypt backing us up. We'll have Assyria backing us up. We'll just pay them off, and so they will be uh, the help that we'll need against Nebuchadnezzar. And he says there, nope, that's not going to work because I'm going to defeat them. I'm going to destroy them with Nebuchadnezzar. And amazing, later on, he calls Nebuchadnezzar, now think of this, how wicked Nebuchadnezzar is. God calls Nebuchadnezzar my servant. Interesting. Such a wicked individual as Nebuchadnezzar compared to the nation of Israel, the chosen people, the holy people, Nebuchadnezzar is my servant. He's going he's gonna to do my bidding, I'm, and he's going to think it's all about him. He's going to actually attribute it to his own gods, according uh, to what uh, Habakkuk says. Very interesting. No, he's my servant. You are going away, because you are my people, and you should have known better. And then notice here, this is one of the most heart-wrenching passages in Jeremiah, verse number 1 of chapter 3. They say, if a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? The answer is no. Shall not that land be greatly polluted? What usually took place, and according to what the law actually says in the law of Moses, that if a, if a man uh, divorces a woman, he will then go and marry another one if he deems necessary, but yet he would never go back to the woman once he is divorced her. That is what is not usually done. Here, God could very well put a bill of divorcement against the nation of Israel because of what uh, adultery that the nation of Israel spiritually had uh, against the Lord. And he could have rightly said, we are done. But here's what he says. But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again 
to me, saith the Lord. The tender mercies of God return again to me. That's not what's usually done, but I still want you. I still love you. Come back to me. I know all that you have done. Return back to me. He knows that it will be landing on deaf ears. They will not return to him. And the rest of it, he gives explanation about, okay, do you wonder why you, you don't have the rain that you need for your, uh, your, your agriculture, your fruits? Do you know why? Because because you did this in the land and polluted it, I'm not going to bless you anymore. Because you're not coming back to me. Return again to me. I love that. It shows God that loves his people. And think about this. We are his people. He loves us. Even though we mess up at times. And we do. It's just natural human existence. Is that uh, if you, I heard it said, Charles Spurgeon once said, that uh, if someone has said something negative against you, he says, be of good cheer. You're much worse than what they can make you out to be. So, <laughs> Charles Spurgeon had a way with words. Uh, so, think about it. We, as, as human beings, we're sinners, and God still loves us. God still sent his son into the world to die on our behalf. But here's the thing about it. We should not be oblivious to sin in our life. We should not be oblivious to God's working in our life either. We need to return to God if we are far away. We need to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. If we do that, we will be closer and closer with Him farther away from the things of this world that could entangle us and could destroy our fruit. God deserves all of our love. God deserves all of our respect, all of our worship, and we need to get closer to Him. Now, if we have some sort of sin in our life that's keeping us from Him, or there's a hindrance in our life that's keeping us not as close to God as what we could have, then may we make the opportunity, may we decide, I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to turn my eyes from this sin to God, who is deserving all of my praise. Get rid of this hindrance in my life, whatever it might be, and come back to God. Return again to me, God says. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this night you have given us. We rejoice in how wonderful you are. How amazing your love for us is. Father, may you help us to decide to get closer to you. May this week be a, a week of just an amazing reality of getting closer and closer with you. May we confess and forsake the sins that might so easily beset us. Help us to get rid of those weights, the hindrances in life that could cause our eyes from going from you to it. Father, we thank you for uh, this evening. We thank you for your word, and may it truly uh, permeate in our lives so that we might have more and more love for you and less love for this world. I do pray, in Jesus' name, amen.